G'day guys and welcome to another episode of the Mindful Men podcast. I'm your host Simon Rinney and today we're getting mindful about forensic psychology and what it's like working in this field. I'm super excited. I've got Dr. Lena Haji on the line from Miami, Florida, who happens to be in New York at the moment. How are you going, Lena? I'm doing fantastic, Simon. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I follow you on Instagram and love everything you post. Oh, thank you. And back at you. I've been wanting to do this chat for quite a while. I remember being in my social work graduation and I had all these forensic psychologists going up and getting their certificates. And I remember that you were a forensic psychologist. So I'm like, I need to talk to someone on the podcast about (laughs) forensic psychology. So when I look at forensic psychology, I look at it as being one of those sexy kind of fields. It's really interesting. It's the stuff that they make TV shows out of and and so forth. So I'm happy to pick your brain today. I'm excited for you to pick my my (laughs) But you're you're a licensed clinical psychologist, a licensed mental health counsellor as well, a forensic psychologist, and you're also the woman behind Rise Psychological Services as well. I am. And now you make me feel super important and with a big ego. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so today's going to be a bit about finding out about who you are and, and, and what you do. And we'll talk a bit about growing up as well. We've got a bit of a story there that I'd like to explore. And then, and then yeah, your work into forensic psychology. But also I love on your Instagram, you do a, a lot of self-care stuff as well. So I'm, I'm really keen to talk about that because it's really important in the helping professionals um, that we balance our self-care. So, so let's start off and, and hear a bit about you, you know, where you grew up and what some of the big things that you've done over your, your life, whether you've traveled, studies, what's been some exciting things that make you tick? Gosh, Simon, uh, that's a loaded question and something in a question I'm very excited to answer. So I'll start from the beginning. Uh, my mother is French from France. My father is Indian from Tanzania. Mm -hmm. I was born in Switzerland and raised in New York, and now I live in Miami. (laughs) So I have this fantastic international background. Uh, The way that that happened is my parents worked worked for the United Nations. And so um, it was ingrained in my head at a very young age that I am to pursue a life that, it sounds very cliche, but to pursue a life that helps other people or else Mm -hmm. there's no there's no purpose in life unless you're helping other people. I mean, it was really drilled into, into my head at a young age, which, which I'm grateful for. So yeah. I wouldn't have be, been like a Wall Street broker or something that wouldn't have flown in my family. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I grew up in New York City. I, I, um, uh, let's see, I have a bachelor's degree in psychology and then I have a master's degree in forensic psychology and then I have another master's degree in clinical psychology and then I have a doctorate in clinical psychology with a forensic emphasis. I went a little nuts with school. <laughs> uh, That's that, I was going to ask why, why so much yeah. study? <laughs> well, you know, I, my parents were immigrants and so I didn't have a lot of information into the U- U.S. Um, educational system. So a lot of it was kind of trial and error. I, I was definitely not somebody who did everything by the book. I, j- I zigzagged my way through life. I knew at a very young age, I wanted to be a psychologist. And so I did my bachelor's in psychology and I I didn't know that how to keep going. I just knew that I wanted more information. And so then I did a master's in forensic psychology and I was completely intrigued. And I worked at the master's level for a very long time. And then I thought, well, I should keep going. I want more knowledge. I, I, you know, I met women who were forensic psychologists and I was floored that, you know, young attractive women could work with psychopaths and sex offenders and drug dealers and gangbangers. And I was like sold. And so then I did my doctorate and and on my way to my doctorate, I got another master's degree. So that one was actually kind of by default. Um, So yeah, that's how that happened. What was study like growing up for you? Was, were you really into study then like growing up as a child or teen? Well, education was, was drilled into my head. My father spoke nine languages wow. and uh, yeah he was in mensa he had like an iq that was insane um and he was originally indian and i don't know if you know much about indian populations but they are 
obsessed with education. Mm -hmm. So it was never a question of going to college. It was which college. And, yeah. you know, I, for a long time, Indian, Indian families tend to make you believe that there are like three professions, doctor, lawyer, and businessman. You know, <laughs> I didn't even know there were other things you could do. And funny enough, all my Indian cousins went to all the Ivy League schools. They went to Harvard, Yale, Brown, Stanford. And I went to community college in the Bronx. So I was actually considered like the fuck up, like the black sheep <laughs> fuck up. Um, you know, my father went to Cambridge and London School of Economics. And so, and I was just kind of hanging out in the Bronx doing, you know, whatever. Um, so yes, education was a very, very big part of growing up. I was always class clown, shocker. But I did manage to get good grades and I, and I, I have always enjoyed learning for sure. So yeah. uh, I do love school. I'll so complain about it when I'm in it, but I love it. Yeah. So like growing up, did you, how did you balance study? Like, did you do sports as well? Or did you do the arts or music? Like, how did you balance that? I've been athletic my whole life. When I was a kid, I was a gymnast, a rhythmic gymnast with the ribbon, the hoop, mm -hmm. the ball. Um, for me, athletics has been such a huge part of my life because um, it has gotten me through parental parents getting divorced. It's gotten me through depression. It's gotten me through anxiety. It's gotten me through, um, you know, substance use. It's gotten me through so many things where it was kind of, it kept me grounded. I could be fucking up all over the place, but I still had to be at basketball practice. Yeah. Or I could be, you know, getting drunk all weekend, but I still still had to kickbox on Monday. And it, it, it allowed me to learn about self-discipline, structure, and just overall wellness. Even if the rest of my life was going to shit, which I was very good at that for a very long time, um, sports remained a constant. And it helped me build relationships, understand teamwork, self-esteem, getting to know people. I mean, I'm very biased when it comes to exercise and athletics. I think it's such a amazing free medicine that's mm. not talked about enough yeah definitely so growing up um i was reading a bit about you um you're all over the web so you're famous <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if that's a good thing or not <laughs> no it's a great thing and, and so last year there's an, an article from voyage mia that I, I read which is a really great article and i'll put the link in um in the show notes for anyone to read a bit about you as well if they're interested but you okay. talk about experiencing depression secondary to conflict with your parents, yes. uh, particularly growing up. So I was wondering if you could describe a little bit about what, what you meant by this and, and what happened and, and how it impacted you. Nine years old, I, was, I, I remember um, I was in the back of my parents' Volvo. My father was driving, my mother was in the passenger seat and I was in the back with my little sister and I felt something in my throat. And I said to my mother, I, I can't swallow. And she didn't think anything of it. She thought, well, she mu you must have a cold or maybe strep throat. And she was a, she's a great mother. And she took me in her, she said, we'll go to the doctor. You'll be fine. And I said, no, something's stuck in my throat. I can't swallow. Very long story short, over the next three months, I didn't eat one morsel of food, no mm -hmm. food. And nobody understood what was going on. Uh, a couple of doctors accused me of being anorexic and wanting to lose weight because I was a gymnast at the time. I had neurological tests, wires coming out of my head, cardiologists. They even went so far as to hospitalize me and put a camera down my throat to see if something was actually stuck. And after all these medical tests, they finally came to the conclusion that I had conversion disorder, um, that I was so stressed and so anxious and so depressed about something that I had convinced myself that I could not swallow. Wow. Uh, which was mind blowing to my parents, you know, and, and they were almost about to feed me intravenously. Um, and so they ended up putting me on Prozac at age nine. My parents, you know, nobody wants their nine year old on Prozac, especially back then it had just come out. Nobody knew what, what it was, what was going on. Um, and I remember my mother took me to a very famous uh, clinic here in New York called the Karen Hornet Clinic. And for the first time, a woman had asked me questions that no other doctor had asked me. She asked me, you know, I didn't know what death or suicide was, but I can remember feeling like I didn't want to be on the earth anymore. I mean, mm -hmm. I was only nine. And she asked me that question. Do you sometimes feel you weren't, you don't want to, you wish you weren't here? And I said, yes. And she just 
listened to me and didn't accuse me of wanting to lose weight and didn't yell at me for not eating. And she was so empathic and so responsive that I left that appointment and I asked my mother, what was that woman? And my mother said, that was a psychologist. And I, that was it. At age nine, I was sold. I said, I have to become a psychologist because I felt so understood and hurt for the first time by all these doctors that I had seen. Yeah. And so it turned out, you know, my parents had a lot of volatility and my father had stopped speaking to my mother and they were, they should have divorced. And, and because of that chaotic household, I ended up with this physical symptom. Wow. Which is nuts. Yeah. And, 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 it evolved. and in, in your household, like was talking about emotions, like something that was normal or you wouldn't do it. So interestingly enough, my father, my mother is very, she's French and she talks like this and she's very verbal and very expressive. And my father is very Indian, was very Indian, hush, hush, mental issues don't exist. We just, yeah sweep them under the rug, you know, very Indian African culture. So it was these two polar opposites. And what happened was my dad had given my mother the silent treatment for two years. Wow. So they were in the same house and my mother was yelling and screaming and my father would not answer her. And I guess neither of my parents, you know, they knew it was crazy and it wasn't a way to live, have a marriage, but they never thought it would affect their children to the, you know, my parents weren't bad people or malicious. But it wasn't until they said, somebody said to my mother, you need to leave him or mm -hmm. your daughter's going to die. And that's how they ended up divorcing. So of course, for a, a long time, I blamed myself for their divorce because if Lena had eaten, her parents wouldn't have gotten divorced. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it was this mix between this kind of European, we talk about everything, we don't hide everything. And then this Indian African culture of hush, hush, we mm -hmm. pretend we don't problems we sweep it under the rug just carry on with your life you know pull yourself up by the bootstraps yeah and it was which is interesting when you're a multi-ethnic person because you're like what, yeah. what do I do do you think some of that from your dad was also about um for men who really struggled to open up and talk about those types of things as well absolutely I think it was a bit of the machismo you know alpha male toxic masculinity mm -hmm. type of Men don't cry, men don't emote. It doesn't matter how you feel, show up anyway. Yeah. Um, especially coming from those cultures where it's still very ingrained. I think that was normal for him. You know, he, my father never missed a day of work and my father battled depression horribly his entire life, but he never missed work, which in his mind, I'm not missing work and I'm providing for my children. Everything's fine. Yeah. And it's like, no, it's not fine. Nothing is fine. Yeah. Wow. And it's so hard, you know, I had similar experiences growing up. I remember mom and dad have, and, and this has been coming up for me recently. Mom and dad had a business way back when, when I was probably similar age, maybe a little bit older and they would fight often as well in the household. And I'd listen from another room and, and dad would often say nothing. And mom would be the one trying to draw it out of him try to get a response for him. But he was very shut, shut up shop as well. And, and then, you know, 30 years later when I'm starting my business now we're about to go live in a couple of weeks with my therapy business which is very exciting and very scary at the same time That's but I'm I've really got these exciting. things in my mind about business and I'm a bit worried and and worried that my relationship with my wife might go down that same path but I'm determined not to let that happen and be open with her and and try and you know when we need to fix things up we'll fix things up if everything's going well, fantastic. But if things aren't going well, it's also important to speak up from our relationship perspective as well. So it's something that I've been thinking about um, recently as well. Um, but I'm glad that when you went to the psychologist, this psychologist and who's got you on this psychology path, that she actually listened to you and heard your story. And I was actually watching, looking at your Instagram post just before we got online with Easy Conversations. Um, yeah. And you're talking about misdiagnosis and you do talk about misdiagnosis a lot on your Instagram page. And, and it is so true what you were saying in terms of our physical health, you know, doctors will, will push us in different uh, testing to, to find out what's going on. But when it comes mm -hmm. mentally, it's often swept under the carpet or just disregarded, um, which can be quite frustrating for a lot of people who have something that's going on and the mental does certainly affect the physical as well but they can't get the answers. And it's, and, but when they finally do get the answers from the right person, it can be so empowering to, to start a journey of healing and, 
and discovery and, and moving forward. I mean, I, I post a lot about diagnosis. Obviously, like I said, from me, it came from, from, from a personal place. You know, they said you are anorexic or mm -hmm. you're lying. You know, they accused a nine-year-old kid of lying. I had one pediatrician who yelled at me with a pretzel and said, eat this. I know you can. And it was like, you know, it's crazy. And I think when it comes to medical health, like, for example, if you go to a doctor and you say, I have headaches all the time, they're going to try to figure out, is it a stress headache? Is it a migraine? Is it a brain tumor? Mm. Because it, it, that matters to guide the course of treatment. But in mental health, we don't tend to do that. People just kind of go, I'm depressed or I'm anxious or I have ADHD. And we give, each, give ourselves these DSM labels, mm. which doesn't explain anything. I, I'm very, uh, I'm a huge proponent of the, D, of the DSM, but I know that it has its limit. It's good for clinical lingo. It explains a cluster of symptom and that's great, but it doesn't talk about everything, the biology, the sociology, the yeah. cultural component, the, you know, and, and I think the amount of people that get misdiagnosed with example for ADHD, you know, I was just doing a feedback session with a girl half an hour ago. She said, I have ADHD and the, the psychiatrist gave me, you know, a stimulant. And I did a full battery of, of tests on her. It took me almost a month to complete this report. She doesn't have ADHD. She has a history of trauma. Mm. She was sexually assaulted. So of course she presents with inattention, but she's actually pretty much dissociating because she's been traumatized. And yeah. to think that she just walked into an office and said, I have ADHD. And they said, here's some legal methamphetamine. Good luck without asking any questions. And she's only 19. And I thought, I'm so glad you came to me, not because I'm the be all and end all, but that you came to me and did this whole process of diagnostic clarification because you don't have ADHD at all. You have, you have PTSD. Yeah. You know? yeah. And that drives me nuts because it's so prevalent in mental health. So prevalent. And, and on the other side, like we've, we've had COVID the last few years. So I recently went to the, my GP and my usual GP who does my medication for, for depression, anxiety and so forth. He's gone on leave. I, I'm hoping he's, he's okay if it's not COVID related or burnout or anything like that. But then I went to another one and, and his response was interesting. He's, I said, I need to have a medication review because I, I didn't think it was working at the time. And I think the, the GPs that we have here, I'm not sure what it's like over there. They're so under pump and it's really hard to get into one at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, he was like, okay, well, what medication do you want to go on? <laughs> I'm like, aren't you the doctor? Um, didn't and you go to medical school? Well, and <laughs> this 19 year old, the mother just told me the same thing. She said that when she was five, five, they told her she has ADHD. She showed her a list of psychostimulants and told her pick one. Mm. But aren't you the doctor? Shouldn't you tell me what my child needs? And, and how do you diagnose ADHD after talking to a five year old for four minutes? Mm. Mm. What, what is that? That's crazy. Yeah. And, and it and, happens all the time. Yeah. And uh, this is the first time I've ever experienced this particular issue. And it, and it was either me pick a different medication and or pick a psychiatrist. I'm like, I'm taking the psychiatrist because at yes. least they know what they're talking about. Yes. Um, and then $500 later, I had that to pay for a psych to see for a 30 minute medication review. Um, and I imagine so many people are out there experiencing the same frustration or but also, I guess, I guess in this post-COVID world, our GPs, because the our in, in, over here, like if if a doctor or a nurse or anyone in that medical profession has COVID, they have to be off. They can't can't still mm -hmm. carry on. Whereas the rest of society seems to just be carrying on with with COVID and 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 moving forward. So I think that's what's contributing to the lack of doctors available. And then okay. they're just pushing through people through as many as they can get through just to get through the day. So. Um, interesting times anyway. And, and I love, yeah, what you, what you're doing on Instagram around diagnoses and, and, and educating us about DSM fives and, and, you know, I know from the DSM four to five and I've got, I live with OCD and that changed even just where it was sitting in the DSM. Uh, yes. <laughs> so trying to keep up to date with all that type of stuff and, um, is quite challenging, but anyway, we could do another episode on the DSM. <laughs> DSM. Yes, we certainly can. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just go randomly pick pages and talk about yes. them. Yes. Um, but uh, but given your experience of what happened in childhood, how do you think that's impacted you to be the person you are today? Oh, I think it's literally guided every single step of my life. I mean, not only with becoming a psychologist, but um, having this almost obsession with misdiagnosis because 
I was misdiagnosed as a child. I also struggled uh, with OCD in adolescence, a lot of ritualistic behaviors mm -hmm. and counting and touching things. And, and uh, that was never properly diagnosed. My depression was never properly diagnosed. I was told I had bipolar and four, I mean, I was told I had everything in the book, but nobody ever really took the time to do a thorough psychological assessment and a history and find out what was really going on with me. Mm. And so because it happened to me personally, it really drives me nuts almost to a pathological level when I see other people get misdiagnosed. And so it's mm -hmm. become this passion of mine because, um, you know, and again, I know the DSM-5 TR, you know, the DSM has, has, has a place. It's not the be all and end all, but it's a starting point. And it's yeah. a way to under conceptualize someone and to kind of guide treatment. You know, for example, bipolar versus borderline, borderline, they need DBT bipolar. You need a medication because yeah. it's, you know, and, and we mix those up all the time. And then people, and for patients, it's horrible. They, they think something's wrong with me. I'm not getting mm. better. They have treatment fatigue. I've spent all this money. The lithium's not working. And it's like, because you're misdiagnosed. Yeah. And so um, not only have I felt that frustration as a child, as a teenager, and as an adult, but I've seen it in my patients and it's mm -hmm. just, it's heart wrenching for people to think there's no hope for them or to yeah. think they're not getting better, but because they're on the wrong path to healing, that's horrible. Yeah. It's horrible. It, it, yeah. It certainly shapes how we, how we think and feel as we move forward. And, and, and I mean, the OCD pathway, a lot of people go undiagnosed for up to, I think the average is about 15 or so years, roughly wow. from first symptom to treatment. And a lot of that's internalized. They're like, what's wrong with me? Yes. Um, but I guess it's also around lack of education and community about anything other than depression or anxiety. <laughs> you know, whenever you hear about mental health, it's depression, anxiety, depression, anxiety, or bipolar yes. or schizophrenia. Like these are the big, the big ticket ones. Yeah. OCD is, is one that's often laughed about. It's the joke in movies or TV shows. It's um, I remember when COVID hit and I was at work and, and someone said in a team meeting at work, oh, all the people with OCD would be happy now because we're going to be washing our hands. <laughs> and I'm just like, wow. <laughs> That's horrible. And yeah, OCD. And, and I've, I've made a post about it on Instagram. People think OCD is that, you know, you're neat and organized. OCD is so horrendously debilitating. Yeah. I mean, you know, the thoughts, the, the obsessive thoughts, the compulsive behaviors, the time that it takes, the chronic fear it's really not, I keep my house clean and I have hand sanitizer. If, if you saw my house, it's a complete bobs hit it. <laughs> yeah, me too. When I had OCD, my room was a mess, but I went to bed at two o'clock in the morning because I was so busy engaging in different ritualistic behaviors. I didn't, nobody would think I had OCD. Yeah. Um, and that was misdiagnosed as well. Yeah. yeah. So I feel your pain for sure. Yeah, I, I do feel you paid at 2 a.m. in the morning. I remember it taking me two hours to get to bed because I was doing my checking behaviors of everything. And, yes. And everyone was asleep. So, and, it, and I think that adds to the silent disorder because a lot of it you can do without people noticing in OCD as well. So but that's another episode. We'll tick that one off. Yes, in the yes, yes. But at 23, you started working in a minimum security prison. Um, and then, you know, obviously you've gone on to do your forensic psychology study as well. So firstly, what was it like at 23 walking into that kind of environment? Like it might have been pretty eye-opening or daunting. What was it like? I think I had watched Silence of the Lambs or something and thought, <laughs> yep, I, that's it. I need to be Clarice. I need to be Clarice. And I remember I took kind of a dumbed down version of forensic psychology in college. It was called Psychology and the Law. You know, mm -hmm. and this beautiful Barbie looking blonde bombshell woman walks in and she starts talking about how she works with psychopaths and serial killers and drug dealers and I was just my jaw was dropped because I thought how is this woman working with these this population and that was another point in my life where I was like sold this is what I want to do um, and of course incarcerated populations are very much the the forgotten population and mm. lock up and throw away the key type of attitude yep. and and they especially in the U.S. they've become the new psychiatric hospitals so um you know, that was what I remember I was 23 and I applied, I had no idea what I was doing. I applied to this minimum security prison in New Jersey and they called me for an interview. I have no idea why they must've been desperate. And I got there and I interviewed well. And they said to me, if you really want this job, you'll come back tomorrow and you'll lecture 150 inmates in the auditorium 
on feelings and emotions. And I thought, you know, it was almost like they were setting me up to fail. And I thought, I'm going to do this. And I went home and I wrote the whole presentation on feelings and emotions. And I got all ready. And I went to back to the prison the next day and I was, I was shaking and my knees were buckling and I was sweating. And I walk into the auditorium and it's 150 guys in orange jumpsuits, hardened criminals sitting there like, what could this young chick probably have to teach me about anything? And I got up there and I just said, I'm going to, you know, fight through the fear. I'm going to do it. And I got up there and I started talking about feelings and emotions. And for some reason they listened and they, they respected me and they engaged and they asked questions. And it was another pivotal moment in my life where I thought, that's it. This is what I, I, this is amazing. Like I didn't think any of these guys would listen to me and somehow I got the job and that's where it all started, but it was terrifying. Yeah, and I, I learned think, a lot of hard lessons at that job. I can imagine. And, and when you're saying, when you were describing that, it, the first thing that popped in my mind just then was prisoners are people too. Yes. You know, they experience emotions and feelings. And just because they're in prison, yeah, they might have not been able to control them outside of prison, but that's not necessarily why they're even in prison to be to start with. Um, Correct. No. And also, you know, we lump inmates together, uh, at least in the US, you know, they're, if you have a 19 year old inmate who's incarcerated because he's from the ghetto and his mother was a prostitute and his father was absent and he literally didn't know where his me next meal was coming from and nobody cared if he showed up at school and he started selling drugs to feed his siblings. Uh, you know, I'm not excusing his behaviors, but that's a very different type of criminal than let's say a 45 year old pedophile. Those mm. are two completely different criminals with completely different crimes, with completely different circumstances. And yet we shove them together and just go, oh, well, they're inmates and they're criminals. And it's like, yeah. wait, the 19 year old, he needs resources, support, education, skills. He needs, you know, the 45 year old pedophile. I mean, he needs some sex offender treatment, but how can you lump those two guys together? Yeah. And that's what happens. They're just inmates. Yeah. And expected yes. to get along and, and, you know, follow orders and follow yes. a new system. And, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, and then come out of prison and not re recidivate. Mm. Yeah. And sometimes like I've worked a lot with in the last few years in the child protection space and, and, particularly seeing, and even in and the youth justice space as well in the disability. So I fund, have been funding disability supports for people, for children and, and, and adults as well, but particularly in that child protection space. And sometimes some of these youth offenders, they re-offend just to go back in because they feel safe in that kind of environment as well. Absolutely. I remember the first time that I was working, I was working at Sing Sing Correctional Facility, which is a famous maximum security prison in New York. And I, I had this one inmate patient and he went up for his parole hearing and they granted him parole. And they said, you can leave prison tomorrow, but you have to be on parole for five years. And he mm -hmm. denied it. He said, no, I'd rather stay in here and finish my time. And I was floored. I didn't understand. And I met with him. I said, are you crazy? You, you just got a chance to get out you get out. And he, he said to me, you know, I didn't have my doctorate yet. He said, Miss Haji, um, I don't think you understand. I don't know how to survive out there. Mm. I'm institutionalized. I go out there. I don't have food. I don't have medical care. I can't stay sober. I don't have any family. I don't have any support. I would rather be in here. And that broke my heart because I thought, oh my God, they opened up the door and said, go. Mm. And he said, I, I can't, I'd rather be in here. And I thought that was an anomaly and it's not. I've come across many inmates who say, at least in here, I get food, I get a bed, I get medical care, I get a therapist, I get, I mean that, you know, out there I have nothing. Yeah. And that's heartbreaking. And yeah, it, it must be like, and, and to have to process that and even come to that, that decision inside as well must be really, I guess, uh, exhausting for, for for inmates and 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 the support teams around so people like yourself people trying to get them out and get them yeah. well but then you know there's a like hospitals there's only so many beds um, right you know how do you how do you manage that like did that impact in terms of you know, that kind of story impact in terms of um how many people that you were supporting or, or people in the prison did they have to turn did they have enough beds and and, and cells and all that type of stuff I mean, the United States has, you know, 25% of the world's prison population. We love locking people up here. 
Mm. It's ridiculous. Uh, we have more prisons than any other country in the world, from what I understand. Uh, so yeah, they had a bed. We locked people up all the time, but I just thought it was so heart wrenching that this is the richest country in the world, quote unquote. And yet we don't have resources to find him a job or an education or housing or a support system on the outside, but we will certainly pay to keep him locked up, which costs mm. just as much, if not more. Yeah. Um, what a broken system. I mean, how does that serve him and how does that serve society? No matter what political spectrum you're on, liberal, conservative, that doesn't serve anyone. It doesn't mm. serve anyone. It's, so, it's, it's like it's locking the door and throwing away and, and then not looking that, that in that direction. So exactly. Um, so since this time, you've you've worked in over nine prisons. Um, is it still nine or have you, you increased that now? I think I've added maybe six jails since then. <laughs> but I don't, I, 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 I'm not in there 40 hours a week anymore. I go in, I evaluate and I leave. It's very different. <laughs> yeah. So what, what's the difference between a prison and a jail? Because it's very different over there than I say over here. Yeah. So jail here is before you're convicted. You're awaiting mm -hmm. trial. So you've been arrested. You're coming right off the street into jail and you're waiting to go through the legal process. Prison, you've already been sentenced. You've been convicted. And now you are doing your time, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Uh, so prison is usually more long term. Jail is a little bit more chaotic. There's a lot more turnover. People are coming off the streets. So they're, they're high, they're sick, they're unmedicated, they're dirty, they haven't showered. Jail is a lot more chaotic. Prison is yeah. usually by the time guys get to prison, they know how much time they're serving. They know they've been convicted. They are, they've been showered, they've been detoxed, and they're kind of ready yeah. to move on. And have you, you've gone through minimum security prison. What about, have you gone into like a maximum or anything like that between the different types? Yeah, absolutely. I've mostly worked in maximum security prisons. I was a clinical director of a maximum correctional facility here in Florida, and it housed the 500 worst inmates in the state of Florida. So these aren't just guys that rape and murder in the community. These are guys that rape and murder in prison. They wow. continue to carry on their criminal activity. So high-ranking drug dealers dealing drugs in the prison. Again, guys who stab, fight, rape, murder, even in, while they're incarcerated. So a lot of high psychopathy, antisocial personality disorder, mm -hmm. really the worst of the worst, if you will. Um, yeah. yeah. I managed that for almost a year. That was fun. <laughs> well, and have you done just men or have you worked with women as well, like in women's prisons? I worked in women's prison, but not, not as long. I think it was about only about a year I worked in a women's prison. It was very interesting. Um, I, I, more of my experience and knowledge is with male inmates, but I have worked with female inmates and I do evaluate female inmates for the uh, court system. Yeah, cool. So tell us a bit about what it's like working in these environments as a professional, as a helping professional um, between the minimum to the maximum, like what's the kind of supports that you would provide in a day to day and, and how is it like interacting between staff and, and inmates as well? So it varies very greatly from state to state here in the US. Um, I've worked in the Florida prison system, the New York, New Jersey and California prison system. Uh, the prisons in Florida are privatized, which mm -hmm. is horrendous. I literally wrote my dissertation on it. So they're literally making a profit off of people's yeah. misery, right? So they're lower resources, lower, I'll give you an example of Florida. The average Florida prison has one to two psychologists per 1200 inmates, Wow. Uh, maybe five to 10 therapists and one or two psychiatrists or nurse or psych psychiatric nurse practitioners. Whereas a California prison has 24 psychologists, 24 social workers, 24 forensic psychiatrists, and 24 music and art therapists. So that's a huge disparity from two to 24. Um, so it really varies from, from state to state. Um, I find that the biggest challenge with working in prison is a lot of times mental health and security staff, correction officers are like this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, security views us as what they call hug a thugs uh yeah they think we're soft and that you know oh poor guy he's mentally ill and and we don't understand their criminality and how manipulative they can be and mm -hmm. and we view correction officers as too harsh and 
corrupt and they're smuggling in drugs. And so you have a lot of mental health and security doing this. Yeah. I have worked in some prisons where security and mental health work hand in hand. And that is such a beautiful environment because it's a balance between security and yeah. meeting mental health and medical health needs. Um, so, you know, a lot of people ask me, isn't it dangerous? And it's like, well, yes, of course it's dangerous. You're dealing with criminals. Um, but I find that 99% of inmates, if you treat them with respect, they will treat you with respect. Yeah. You have your couple assholes and your couple psychopaths and your couple guys that really, no matter what you do, they just don't give a fuck. And they will yell at you and scream at you, spit at you, threaten you, pull out their penis, whatever. But the majority of them, they're humans, just like mm. you and I. They yeah. took the wrong path. They made horrible decisions. If if you treat them with respect and you're fair, firm, and consistent, you will get respect back. Yeah. Um, and your word of mouth is your most powerful tool in prison. You mm -hmm. know, be honest, be fair, be firm, have good boundaries, be consistent, and you will be respected if you kind of are nice on Monday and then a horrible bitch on Tuesday, or you promise something on Wednesday and you don't deliver on Thursday, you're not going to be respected. You know, your word is everything in prison. And so some, even though I tend to take a firm boundary, assertive, tough approach, um, probably because I've done it for so long, inmates tend to respect that. They mm. know that, you know, you can't pull one over on Dr. Haji. You can't lie to Dr. Haji. She's going to call you on your shit. Yeah. But I feel like holding them accountable is something they want. They might not know they want it. It's <laughs> something they want, they need, they, they lack. They enjoy structure. They enjoy somebody mm. calling on their crap because nobody ever has. That's how they ended up in prison. Yeah. Uh, and like what some of the themes that come through for like with the men that you've worked in particular, given this is the Michael Men podcast, like are they struggling? Is it substance abuse that's got them in prison? Is it mental health? Is it? disability what's what's some of the themes that you're seeing in terms of or trends that you see in the, the work that you've been doing i think it's such a combination of things i think substance abuse is huge yeah. huge because you have people who are addicted to substances who in, end up engaging in crimes that if they were sober they wouldn't have engaged in yeah. again i'm not excusing their behaviors but you know you draw a line in the sand and say, well, you know, I'm using cocaine, but I'll never rob from somebody, but then your addiction gets worse. And then you rob from somebody and then you steal. And then, you know, and on and on, it's this downward spiral. I think substance abuse is huge. I think the other issue I see is um, chronic poverty and lack of education. Mm -hmm. You know, if, so, if there's a 25 year old guy who grew up in the ghetto and never received a high school diploma, has no skills, has no family support, has no resources, Again, not excusing his behaviors, but if he ends up engaging in a life of crime and, yeah. uh, you know, if we had done more early interventions and provided more resources, education and support and athletics and peer support systems and resources and food and shelter. I mean, a lot of these guys would have never ended up incarcerated. Yeah. And then you have, you know, your, your psychopaths, your Jeffrey Dahmer, Ted Bundy's who would have ended up in prison no matter what. Um, but I think those are few and far between. Yeah. And I, I imagine prison would be one of those places where even the hardened criminals can have a space with therapy through yourself or, or another practitioner there and, and actually challenge this men can't cry or talk about emotions. And it, it almost kind of is like the opposite of what we do on the outside is, is we, we bottle everything up. We don't talk about anything, but I guess you're giving the opportunity for the, these really tough guys to, to open up and get vulnerable. I think yes and no. I think unfortunately a lot of these guys have never had any kind of mental health treatment or any kind of mental health intervention at all until mm -hmm. they came to jail or prison, yeah. you know, and it's, it's just, and they come in there and, and it's this kind of, they have to be an alpha male and a, and a tough guy because it's a dangerous environment. They mm -hmm. can't be soft. They can't, they can't present as a mushy, soft, effeminate, whatever you want to call it, these kind of ridiculous terms, because it's a, it's a matter of life or death. It's a matter mm. of safety. Um, however, you do have some guys who they come to you and behind closed doors, which is kind of hard in you know just the logistical physical environment of prison it's hard to have privacy and long times yep. alone with people but 
uh, if they're willing and they really have gotten to a place of desperation where it's like, man, I don't want to come back here. I want to change my life. You know, just like anybody else, even in the community, they're willing to do the work and they're willing to change their lives and look at a different perspective. I've definitely had inmates cry and mm -hmm. have breakthroughs and change. And, you know, um, we don't get a lot of thank yous in prison, but when we do, they're so worth it. Yeah. They're so rewarding, you know? Yeah. I often say to myself as part of mindful men, like if I can just help one bloke open up, you know, then I'm doing something right, you know, and to have one person change in a prison or, you know, it must be a phenomenal feeling. Absolutely. I mean, I remember there was this one inmate I worked with. He was a high ranking gang member and he had a major depressive disorder with psychotic features. So when he would get very depressed, he would hear voices. But he was a high ranking gang member, a good looking guy, a, you know, a built guy. I mean, he was a walking stereotype inmate. Um, and he, he, it was a danger for him to come to mental health because in this particular gang, coming to mental health was an absolute no, no, mm. you get literally beat up because it's considered, it was considered a weakness. So he would have to sneak to his mental health appointments. Um, and he was terrified that his gang, uh, affiliates would find out that he was number one, mentally ill and number two, getting help mm -hmm. number three on meds. Um, and then, you know, he managed to finagle his way and get treatment and he got out of prison and about two three years later I got a letter that said um I can't thank you enough I'm off of parole I have custody of my son I'm on wow. my medications I'm sober and I'm working and I mean just sharing this story with you now I get goosebumps because again you do not get a lot of thank yous in prison you get a lot of fuck yous in prison mm. but that one letter that I received maybe in 2009 has carried me since then because, you know, this guy was not supposed to make it. This yeah. guy, everything was against him. He had a major mental illness. He was a gangbanger. He had limited support. He was doing hard time. He was in a maximum security prison. The books, the books tell us he's, he wasn't supposed to make it. Yeah. And he did because he did the work and he got on his meds and he did the therapy and he got out and he got a job and he got custody of his son. And it's just like that one guy, like you mentioned, one guy makes it all worth it. Even if from now till the day I die, nobody else ever changes. That guy made it worth it. It sounds like a movie, what you've just described. Like a, it's this, you know, rags to riches style story. Who, who would play you if you were in, in doing that, casting that movie? Would you, would you cast yourself? I would totally cast myself. <laughs> I don't know if that's me being an egomaniac, but I would totally cast myself. I don't know. That's a good question. Nobody's ever asked me that. I have to come back to you on that one. <laughs> have a think about it. And, uh, I reckon you could do yourself. I reckon it'll be perfect. Um, so this is, is this forensic psychology working in prisons? But you, you, what about the court stuff? You mentioned before that you do a bit of work in court. So tell us a bit about what you do in the courts. So uh, people confuse a lot correctional psychology and forensic okay. psychology. Yep. So what I did for a very long time was correctional psychology, which was what I just explained, mm -hmm. actually working in the correctional facility, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, doing evaluations, suicide treatment, uh, running groups, doing therapy, really providing the treatment for incarcerated individuals. Whereas forensic psychology is, is not in the actual facilities, it's working with the courts. Mm -hmm. So it's it's taking clinical psychology to answer a legal question. So I, since I don't work in the correctional facilities anymore, I do more of um, evaluate, evaluation. So for example, uh, competency to stand trial, mm -hmm. not guilty by reason of insanity evaluations, sex offender evaluations. So the court wants to know, is he, is he insane or is he not insane? And it's, it's, it's such a challenge because first of all, insane is not a clinical word. Mm -hmm. It's a legal term. Yeah. And as you know, for us, it's not that black and white. It's not either you're crazy or you're not crazy. It's so gray. There's a whole yeah. gray area. And we as clinicians, well, you know, but the courts want to know, is he crazy or is he not crazy? So it's applying, it's taking clinical knowledge and applying it to answer a legal question. They want to know, is this sex offender going to reoffend? Mm -hmm. Well, no one really knows, you know, but we can use some actuarial risk assessments and 
put some statistics in and, and do an evaluation and tell you, well, he has a three to 5% chance of recidivating based mm -hmm. on, you know, research and, and normative samples. And so that's more of the work that I'm doing now. Um, it's very, it's very gratifying in some ways, because for example, you know, I may have the, the final say on whether somebody goes to a psychiatric hospital versus a prison. And it feels good to know that somebody could have ended up in prison who's extremely mentally ill. And, and instead, because of something I did or said that they're going to a hospital instead. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a little bit more the forensic work versus the correctional work. Okay. Uh, Good to know. Yeah. I thought, cause it, I thought you say forensic, you think everything prison yes, crime, yes. all this type yes. of stuff. So it's really good to, to differentiate that. And, and how is it going into court? Do you find it intimidating? I, I could imagine that court would be a very intimidating place to be. The first time I had to testify, I was, I was completely just terrified. And as, as you can tell, I mean, I can make Instagram videos and I can talk to you and I can talk about this stuff all day. But when you're in the box with the judge and the attorney's coming at you, it's completely different. Um, and so it's been a learning curve. You know, you have to understand how lawyers think because, yeah. again, they think very black and white. And clinicians, we don't think very black and white. We think very gray. And mm -hmm. well, his trauma affected him, but his, he had good parenting, but he has a support system, but he has depression. We're gray. We're People are mishmashes. And... Um, I testified last week in a competency hearing and the, the, the prosecutor was just coming at me. Well, you seem to be changing your opinion. Well, it says here in page three of your report. Well, now you're going back on your work. And he was drilling me. And I thought, oh my God, I feel like I'm on trial for murder. <laughs> um, and, and the more I do it, the more I enjoy it. Um, being a, an expert witness for the court is, 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 fun but it's it's very nerve-wracking it is very nerve-wracking would you say that's more nerve-wracking than that for when you were 23 doing that that chat sometimes. In front of all the inmates? <laughs> sometimes because when I was 23 as nerve-wracking as I was once I got into the groove of things I felt like this is cool they're listening to me <laughs> whereas in court every single trial is or every single testimony is different yeah so it has a different flavor for sure. And is, yeah. is the judge a liberal judge? Is he a conservative judge? Yeah. Does he even believe in mental health? You know, you have some judges who are like, this is a crock of shit and yeah. they're just wasting our time. Um, so it's, it's very, very interesting and wow. constantly learning. It humbles me a lot. You know, anytime that I think I know it all and I'm good at what I do and it's been 20 years, go to court, the court will humble you in about yeah. three Put years. you back in your place. <laughs> yeah, which is good. I need that because then I'll, I'll go home and be like, I need to read up on this. I need to read yeah. up on this. <laughs> so tell us about uh, Rise Psychological Services and the kind of work you do through that and, and the kind of people that you support. Okay, so I opened Rise in August of 2020. So just celebrating two years. Um, I used to do a little bit of forensic work on the side and I never had the you know, the, the balls to go out on my own completely. You know, I always thought, I really thought you become a psychologist, you work a nine to five, you get a steady paycheck and then you die. <laughs> and I started realizing like, you know, actually I got laid off during COVID, which was terrifying. Yeah, um, It was terrifying because I, I, I got home after being laid off and I applied to 17 jobs and a couple of, of people in my support system said, well, you have this private practice work on the side. Why don't you just do that? And I thought, there's no way. How am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to pay my car note? Yeah. Uh, and I just build on that and build on that. And I started talking to different courts and talking to different counties in the Florida area. And the next thing you know, I thought, I'm never working for anyone again. This is amazing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, it has its ups and downs where, you know, some months, you're like, how am I going to get all this work done? And then some months you're like, why is nobody calling me? So yeah. I, you have to realize it ebbs and flows. But again, so my work is very much doing um, work for the courts, mostly competency to stand trial, mm -hmm. uh, some not guilty by reason of insanity, some uh, juvenile assessments. You were talking about working with juveniles. So um, juvenile assessments in terms of mitigating factors. So especially with young guy, you know, young kids, 16 15, you know, you want them to get treatment mm -hmm. interventions as yeah. opposed to incarceration. I also do law enforcement screenings, which is, I just happened to stumble on that. So anybody who wants to be a police officer, 
in my local area has to come through me for a psychological mm -hmm. evaluation, which is, you know, now they're really focused on that, especially with the culture of police here in the US. I'm sure you guys heard about the George Floyd murder mm, and, yeah. and the racism. And so it's a good thing because they have now they've now hired psychologists to kind of be a barrier. Mm -hmm. Do you have misogynistic attitudes? Do you have racist attitudes? Do you have substance abuse problems? Do you have integrity issues? So you give these police officer candidates these psychological screenings. And of course, they're not foolproof, but you can gen generally measure mm -hmm you know, whether somebody is a good candidate to be a police officer or not, whereas before they didn't do any of that. Hence, George Floyd being murdered by yeah. that psycho. Um, so, and it's such a big problem here in America. Yeah, oh, we certainly see it in, in Australia too I, as well. Similar, similar things, racism, yeah. that toxic masculinity comes through, is very power, power hungry, but not every, not every police officer, like, you yes. know, but um, there's, you can certainly see it in, in when you do talk to some and, and, and so forth, or even just what you see on the news as well. It does happen yes. here as well. So, I bet. Um, so do you, do you provide any one to one therapy in Rise, or do you, is it just the court stuff and the police stuff? Or I had stopped doing therapy for a while just because I was therapied out, yep. <laughs> and I spent so much of my time typing reports that I didn't have much time. But recently, I, I picked up a couple of patients just um, because I thought, you know. I do enjoy therapy and I, I would like to not forget my roots and where I came from. So yeah. I do a little bit on the side, um, a couple of therapy cases here and there and, uh, but mostly evaluations. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do supervision as well? I thought I did read that you did some supervision. Yeah. Tell us a bit about supervision and, and what you do there. I do. So I like to supervise a master's level clinicians. I had such great supervisors and I had some not so great supervisors. And so I really like, I didn't think that I would like teaching and supervising. I thought I'd, I'd be like, I'm done with school. I want nothing to do with students or novice clinicians. I don't want to teach anybody ever, anything, but I stumbled upon that too. Just, I think I was helping a friend or something. And I realized I really enjoy it. I enjoy guiding people who are early in their careers mm. so that they don't make the same mistakes that I made and to kind of give them a good foundation. And so I, I supervise a lot of master's level clinicians and pre-doctoral clinicians. Um, and that's really, really cool because I teach them about things that, again, I had to learn the hard way. You know, people can, man, inmates can be very manipulative. Here's how to not be manipulated. And yeah. here's how you learn about malingering and when they're lying to you. And of course, I'm not talking about all inmates, but some. And uh, so, yeah, I teach a lot about psychopathy. Um, people don't realize how prevalent psychopathy is. And, and um, so I really, I really do enjoy, and that's the other thing I love about being in private practice. It's a mishmash of things. Mm. Well, on Monday, I might do a police evaluation. On Tuesday, I might do a competency for court. On Wednesday, I'll do supervision. On Thursday, I'll teach a webinar. And it's really exciting because I'm never bored. Yeah. Um, always something new and I, and it it keeps me from being stagnant it, I'm, yeah. I'm constantly realizing there's always more to learn don't ever think you're you're at the peak don't ever think you're at the top especially in mental health you know i just learned the dsm-5 and the dsm-5 tr comes out and it's like oh my God. <laughs> yes i did see your post on the yeah. tr and i was like oh no yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like it took me a couple of weeks to buy it and all my colleague friends were like you have to buy it or your reports are going to be outdated. And I'm like, I just learned this one. I can't believe they have another one. This is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So self-care is really important in the helping professionals. And I remember one of the very first posts I saw from yours on Instagram was, I think it was you taking a photo in front of the, the, cam uh, the mirror, maybe after some yoga or Pilates, or you're doing some stretching actually. And then and now you're onto the, I love your gym ones where you're, you're pumping out the weights and making me look really bad because I'm not at the gym at the moment. Uh, but tell us a bit about, you know, you, you grew up playing sport. Do you still do sport outside? Like, do you, or is it just the weights and more of a um, stretching and all that? I did CrossFit for about four years, which is complete insanity. Um, but, you know, it's very go, go, go. And, yeah. and I recently switched to functional training. So, I, you know, I do a lot of weights and cardio and I, I like to run. I actually know I hate running, but I force myself to run. And then I throw in a little bit of yoga in there. But when it comes to self-care, I think, you know, for me, self-care is not just, you see a lot of Instagram 
influencers and people saying kind of self-care is getting your nails done and taking a hot bath or, and I, I don't think that's not self-care. I think that is important to pampering yourself is important as well. But for me, self-care is really holding myself accountable, mm -hmm. you know, making sure I stay humble, making sure that I help other people. I like to do a lot of service work, community work where I'm not getting paid so that I can remember that, you know, I'm lucky enough to do what I love for a living and be able to pay my bills. So I have to give back. Um, that to me is self-care. Self-care is going to the gym, going to yoga, cleaning my house. And then of course, the more pampering stuff, spending a whole day watching Netflix, yeah. going to the beach, maybe going to the spa. And I think that's where people get self-care confused, that it's just pampering. But for me, self-care is really, even if it's going to dinner with some friends to just stop checking your email for mm -hmm. one hour, Yep. Go to dinner with some friends, you know, focus on your friends um, or, you know, do a do a, a, a free class for a school that, you know, doesn't have a lot of resources, things yeah. like that. That's great. Uh, and, and I guess some of that would, would come through in your supervision with with, um, you know, new practitioners coming through as well. And, and the value of self-care and maintaining that from the start, because we often forget that. And then we feel burnt out or, or stressed ourselves. So does that come through in your supervision as well? Absolutely. I mean, I tell, I tell my, my supervisees all the time, you know, even if you're bombarded, a lot of them are doing their doctoral program, which I know is insane because I've done it. You know, I always say, you know, school isn't going anywhere. Jobs are not going anywhere. Prisons and patients are not going anywhere. But you're, you are you you can't burn out because if you burn out, you're not only doing yourself a disservice, you're doing your patients a disservice. I've been burned out. I know what it's like. Mm -hmm. Actually, one of the reasons I left the prison system was because I was realizing that I was, I had become so desensitized that it clouded my judgment, you know, and inmates in, in prison, they'll yell at you, doc, I'm fucking suicidal. And, and I'll say, you're not fucking suicidal. Come on, dude, go back to your cell. You know, you develop that rapport with them where, mm. where they'll, and then they'll chuckle and yeah, Dr. Hodge, you're right. I'm full of shit. And they'll go back to their <laughs> cell, you know, and that's, that's cool. But I was getting to a place where I was being overly, you know, and I don't like to admit this, but where I was being overly dismissive, you know, everybody's full of shit and these inmates are just playing games and you guys are not fucking suicidal. Go back to your cell. You're pissing me off. And I was like, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. I had to stop and realize if somebody is suicidal, Lena, and you're kind of dismissing them because you're burnt out and because you're skeptical and because you're jaded, that's somebody's life you're messing with. Mm. And I, I had to, you know, it took me a while, but, and I'm not proud of it, but it is part of the human experience where I had to stop and go, whoa, I'm detached and I'm, I'm, my um, objectivity is clouded. I'm exhausted. I'm mentally drained and I have to take a step back. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think a lot of people are willing to admit that, you know, we just, especially in prison, it's crisis, 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 crisis. And it's like, well, I thrive under crisis. I do well in prison, but that you can't do that forever without going, yeah. wait a second, you know, let me stop and breathe. Mm. I'm glad you've brought up burnout because it's something that I've experienced as well. And, and that skepticism that you talk about and the, the, the clouded judgment and the detachment is very real. And, and for a, a, you do do that disservice to, to the clients that we work with because our head's not in the game and our hearts aren't in the game as well. And, and taking and acknowledging that is really hard because we often like, it's often particularly in for men like saying that you're burnt out because we've got this hustle culture that we we see yes. now on social media you've got to hustle you've got to hustle got to hustle you know you should be working 24 7 things should be happening for you while you're sleeping all this type of stuff but I mean when I hit burnout I think it was mid 2020 I'd been studying my master's degree part-time for four years I'd be working full-time the whole time we'd had two kids um, we got COVID. So then we were locked down for five or six months as well. And then I also did, and I had my own mental health stuff, which I've had for 30 years, but it was starting to, to spike as well. And then I got like a physical condition with my back, which I think was caused by the burnout because I had all the testing and they couldn't figure out what it was. I just said, it's Simon, it's just back pain. Um, but I could barely walk and, and, and so forth. But then I had to take four months off of work. To, to recover and do nothing, essentially, try to slow my brain down and, and regain some things that I found joy because I, I lost the joy in, in a lot of yes. things. 
Um, so I'm glad you, you bring it up. And burnout is becoming a very real thing. You're seeing a lot about it on the on the socials, on on the news as well. And and I think by having those self care routines from the start and keeping them and, and making them part of your life, not just a, every now and then thing, but an everyday thing um, can go a long way to, to preventing burnout and, and so forth. So I'm glad you brought it up. Um, it is a very debilitating um, thing um, that a lot of us go through, but sometimes we just try to push through um, until you hit the wall. Like I did, I hit the wall and I couldn't keep going. I had to, had to stop. Tools were down and, and I had to stop. So yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. if we don't take a break, our body will take a break for us, you know? Yeah. And you had a lot on your plate. That's a lot. And I'm just like you. I just thought, be stronger, fight harder. You know, nobody's going to do it for you. You have to build the life you want for yourself. And while mm -hmm. all of those things are true, that doesn't mean get rid of balance and become completely nuts yeah. and, and don't sleep and don't exercise and don't socialize and don't meditate or yoga, whatever your thing is, or play the guitar, whatever your thing is, you know, but it's true. Um, I think, and I've gotten, I've gotten burnout for sure. It, it scared me. It scared me for a while because I thought, wow, I don't care about my patients anymore. Mm. You know, and I, I don't admit that a lot because it's, it's almost shameful and embarrassing, but I really felt like I don't care. I don't care what happens to you. And that's not true. It wasn't that I didn't care. It was that I was completely burnt yeah, and that I didn't know what else to do. Um, yeah. And it's not, it's not serving anyone. It's not yeah. serving anyone. So. And, 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 and you, you do raise a great point there is that you, it's not that you don't care. It's just that you, you just spent, you can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> nothing's going in and nothing, everything's, got, you know, it just feels like it's, it's full your head. Um, and yeah, like, yeah. So anyway, I could talk to you all day. <laughs> I could talk to you all day. <laughs> I've got a couple more questions for you and then, sure. and then I'll, I'll let you go for your evening. Um, so what's about some advice that you could give to someone who's just starting out in their career? Um, they might be working in the prison, they might be doing stuff in court, but they're feeling over their head. They might be you know forgot their self-care or it's really intimidating the kind of environments they're working in what's some advice that you can give to maybe a new professional to to kind of work through that so the first advice i would give is do yourself a favor and try your best not to compare yourself to anybody mm -hmm. else i took eight years to complete my bachelor's degree now i was busy fucking around and partying and bartending and doing stuff that i probably shouldn't have been doing everybody else graduated in four years and i graduated in eight I also took extra long to finish my doctorate. Most people do their PhD in five. I did it in seven because I was juggling three jobs. Mm -hmm. And you know, some people were younger than me and some people were older than me. And I found myself really comparing myself. Oh my God, I'm taking so long or I'm 31, everybody else is 24. And so the best advice I can give people is you have no idea what other people are going through. You have no idea what's going on in their life. Do not compare yourself. I have one friend who did everything by the book, so to speak. You know, she was a doctor by the time she was 25. Mm -hmm. She did the bachelor's, she did the doctorate, and she was ready to go. However, she's never traveled. She's never partied. She's never really dated. And so she missed all of those experiences. So one of my main pieces of advice is don't compare yourself. Your journey might zigzag. There are many different paths to the same destination. Yeah. And I had to learn that because I was always hard on myself comparing everybody else. Oh my God, she's already a doctor and I haven't even started my master's degree. Doesn't matter. And the other advice I would give is networking, mm -hmm. making sure you have not just a professional network, but a support network, you know, and I fought against that for a long time. I can do it my, by myself. I don't need to talk to anybody, you know, hard work pays off. And that's true. But to have people to bounce ideas off of and colleagues and somebody you can turn to, or can you help me with this problem? Or I'm not sure if this diagnosis is correct. Can you look over this report? Is it, it's, it's a built-in insurance for you, mm. you know, to, 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 to know that you don't know everything and that bouncing off of other clinicians or other peers or other is always going to serve you. It's always going to serve you. And then the third thing is what you and I just talked about balance yeah do not do not work yourself to death because it's not you're going to hit a wall it's impossible not to hit a wall you're going to hit a wall make sure you have the spa day the mm -hmm. exercise the socializing the sleep yeah the nutrition the the family time the the guitar playing the whatever it is 
make sure you incorporate that in your life or else your body will tell you to do it for you. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful advice. Thank you. Um, two more questions and then I'll let you go. Yes. One, one, have you figured out who's, who you're casting for yourself in that movie? Oh, gosh. <laughs> no, I have to get back to you on that through email or maybe I'll right. send you a DM. <laughs> maybe we'll do up a nice Instagram of you coming soon or something like that. Okay. okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and the last one is to plug something, plug something that makes you feel good. It, I'll, I'll be putting the links to, to your business and the Instagram and, and stuff okay. in the show notes so that people can check you out if they want to. Um, but yeah, what's something that a good resource, a good book, a good TV show you're listening to, something that's making you feel good at the moment? Something that is making me feel good at the moment. Um, I'm obsessed with true crime documentaries. I am. I mean, I used to come home from prison and turn on forensic files or lock up. And my mother used to go, don't you get enough of this at work? And I was like, no, I've been working in prisons for 20 years. And still at night, I watch forensic true crime, Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, every single Netflix forensic documentary that yeah. is on. I watch it. It's just fascinating to me. <laughs> and I never get tired of it. I mean, even my therapist is like, you should watch some comedy. And I'm like, no. <laughs> my own shrink is like, you got to watch something light. And I'm like, Ted Bundy for me is light. Okay. Yeah. Just, I've accepted it a long time ago. Um, I would tell everybody to watch Silence of the Lambs because I told a supervisor to watch Silence of the Lambs the other day. She was 25 years old and she looked at me like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> And I thought, God, I just aged myself. Yep, yep. Um, Silence of the Lambs is a really good, even though the main character is not a forensic psychologist, she's an FBI agent. It's a very good window into forensic psychology, psychopathy. You know, uh, Anthony Hopkins is brilliant. Mm. I can watch that all the time. Um, other than that, I don't know. Check out my YouTube channel or check out my webinars. Those are pretty cool. But cool. seriously, if anybody wants to check out my webinars on a psychopathy or malingering, um, they can just shoot me a DM and I'll give them a like a 90% off discount code. Ah, you know, cool. Awesome. Yeah. That'd be great. Wonderful. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Lena, I've, I've had an amazing time with you this morning, even though it's across the across the globe. Um, really do appreciate your time. Um, go have something to eat and, and okay. drink and chill out for the rest of your evening. And um, yeah, we'll look forward to catching up soon on the, on the Instagram and, and, and follow your journey as well. Simon, this was amazing. You're such a pleasure to talk to. And I love the work you're doing. I mean, Mindful Men is really one of my favorite Instagram accounts. And I'm always like looking for stuff to send or tag you in. And so it's really great what you're doing. It's very necessary, you know, because women dominate this field, but men absolutely need the same kind of, you know, so what you're doing is great. I, I can't thank you enough for having me on. We should do this more often for sure. I've already got about four episodes that we could talk about. Okay, perfect. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Wonderful. Have a good night. Okay. Okay. Have a great day. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure that you like it and leave a comment and then share it with your mates. Also, subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss a moment of future episodes to come. Thank you.